before taking some time to actually learn and connect um, in your busy corporate lives. So what I want to touch on today is some insights I've gained over the last seven years as what I call an accidental content marketer, because um, that term actually didn't, didn't exist seven years ago. Um, and I want to give you some insights from industries that are going to be way outside what you do. So what I'm going to do today is I want to, I suppose, push your comfort zone a bit and challenge you to actually think outside your industry because that's what you need to be doing all the time. You need to be doing that. I went to the Adobe Digital Conference recently, 7,000 digital marketers in Salt Lake City attending the home of the Mormons, which is Salt Lake City. <laughs> and the theme of the conference was reinvention. And the thing you mentioned about the pace of change in digital is staggering. And um, the challenge for us as marketers with old habits and old ways of thinking, and I can put myself in that box because I'm over 50, okay, is really, really important to actually get your head around. And I, I might be challenged every day by 20 somethings, 30 somethings that actually push me around and challenge what I do and also industries that challenge what I think. So, um, this is a book that changed my life seven years ago. I was broke, desperate, and living with my brother. And if I ate another two minute noodles, I would have been top myself. Because for me, I was in a really bad place. But I had time to actually read, and I came across this book and the New Rules of Marketing and PR by David Min and Scott talks about a thing called inbound marketing. Okay, I think inbound and content marketing are just the same thing, different name. And this book changed my life because I had been brought up in a paradigm of outbound marketing. Cold calling, I've done that for years. Who enjoys cold calling here? I can't see one hand. And when I read the book, I went, cool. I don't have to do any more telemarketing. Not that I was doing it at the time, but the fact that I actually could attract customers to me really resonated with me. And on top of that, I actually discovered social media at the same time. And social media was fascinating. And what I noticed about social media, at the time, Facebook was only about 50 million. Twitter had about 2 million users. This was early days, and the discussions you had around the dinner table were, this is just a passing fad, or is it a trend? But there's one thing I really noticed about social media that intrigued me, and that was people were obsessed with it. Right or wrong, that's what it did to us as human beings. And for me, social media was this intersection of humanity and technology. It allowed us to extend ourselves to the world to reach the world with one tweet. And when I saw Twitter for the first time, what the hell do you do with 140 characters? Like seriously. And actually the conversations I had with people over the next three or four years, we were having the same conversation. So 140 characters, what do you do with it? So I leapt on the Facebook, noticed obsession, got onto Twitter, noticed the same thing happening. And when you're desperate and have obsessive technology, things can really happen, okay? And I came across this article. Jennifer Aniston dropped her boyfriend because of obsession with Twitter. And my partner at the time reminded me that someone else was obsessed with Twitter. <laughs> it was me. Luckily, I ignored her. <laughs> we're still together, by the way. Um, but, <laughs> The reality was that I believe that this obsessive nature of the platform and the network, there was something going on. It just resonated with me. So I leapt onto Twitter and my first tweet was, it was really, really insightful. Um, I couldn't find it, but I found a tool that enabled me to find it. Way back, way back. Way back, way back my first tweet, watching the cricket. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually tweeted, I actually wrote a blog post about this about middle of last year and someone said to me, 
what was the cricket doing? He wasn't obviously an Englishman or an Indian. <laughs> he was American. <laughs> so this obsession for me was a sign or an indicator of something much more going on, and that's what happened. Then I came across a blog by HubSpot. And HubSpot, a lot of you I'm sure have heard of, and these guys did content marketing so well and continue to do so brilliantly, right? Absolutely brilliantly. And I was reading a blog post, I realized they were giving away so much free content. I went, wow, they, these guys are giving away so much for free. That is crazy. But they, there was one blog post I came upon which was, if you have an inkling of what you want to write about, just start a blog. Just start. So this fascinated with social media. This reading the new rules of marketing and PR had awakened something within me in terms of what I wanted to write. So I actually started writing a blog in March six years ago, so pretty close to the anniversary of when I started it, with no grand plan, no big intention. And I did it under my own name. And what happened after that surprised me and still surprises me today. Six months later, nothing's really happening. But five years, six years later, I get asked to speak on the other side of the planet, go and attend conferences, get hired as an influencer to train people how to do content marketing. I do not have a marketing degree, I must confess. <laughs> and when I was in Helsinki and Finland, and Finland's one of the top education countries in the world, at the end of the keynote, one person put up their hand and said, what gives you the right to be qualified to speak on this? Because I don't have any formal qualifications. But what I did have qualifications was in the art of doing. So I went to India recently. And as I went to end of the conference, I got picked up by my mind by a young guy called Yashpal. And Yashpal is a young 18 year old Indian in his first year of IT. He was a thousand kilometres north, and Yashpal picked me up. And as we drove down the main way to the Bombay, Bombay Institute of Technology, what I noticed was there was a big banner across the road that had Steve Jobs on it, and then another big banner down the road and had Einstein on it. And then I saw a banner with me on it. And I was just like, what the? It's like, seriously? So American speaker was there actually, got to a picture and I sort of had to put it up on Facebook. So for me, I spent $10 on a domain name. The lesson for me was that with just a $10 domain name, social media, and creating the best content you can at the time, you can reach the world. And you can earn attention. And that surprises me even today. So, this is Yeshpa. So I'd push my comfort zone, but this guy has pushed his comfort zone even further. That's what I want to challenge you today, is push your comfort zones. Okay, Yashpal, 18, is one of 1.3 billion Indians. At the age of 15, he had a burning desire to actually get into the IT faculty as a student. So at the age of 15, he gave up soccer, TV, worked seven days a week, 18 hours a day for three years, and qualified. He was way out of his comfort zone. So as I left Yashpal behind after, he was like my shadow for two days. He's a most gorgeous, soft soul, very bright. I said to Yashpal, keep in touch with me because I want to hear about your success. So, He's pushed his comfort zone. And if I hadn't started that blog six years earlier, nothing would have happened. If I hadn't been prepared to take a risk. Now the challenge for you in this room is you work in a very, very risk averse industry. I know that. So you have a challenge because the corporate is, a, is afraid of risk. So for me, we are in the biggest shift in marketing since the invention of TV, without a doubt, in over 50 years. 
we have the biggest significant change of publishing in half a millennia. Back then when the printing press was invented, it actually increased the rate of content creation enormously. Now we've actually got content marking machines in our pockets, they're called mobile phones. And that's the thing that's really supercharging this, is mobile. The discussions at Adobe's digital conference was a lot around digital and social and mobile. And we're still in huge catch up on this, because when I started the blog, the iPhone had just been started, there was no general acceptance or use of mobiles, it was generally sitting in the hands and purses and pockets of corporates who had their crackberries. Right. So the reality is that this is supercharging and there are predictions by 2017 that mobile and digital will actually be equivalent to what's spent on mass TV advertising by 2017. So you've got to consider this pace of change and the disruption and the reinvention you're going to have to take the reins of and seize it. This is the other thing that's going on. Brands are becoming publishers. Red Bull, we've heard of the Red Bull story a bit. Some recent research shows in Red Bull and themselves are saying that by 2017, they'll actually make more money from licensing their content <coughs> Than they actually make from drinks. Because these guys create epic content, full length feature movies. They actually have a print magazine. Red Bull are one of the top content marketers in the world and they sell drinks. Okay? And guess what? They hardly spend a cent on traditional advertising. And what they do is they don't talk about their stuff. They create conversations around their brand. So what you understand is people don't want to hear about your stuff. They want to hear about what your stuff can do for them. That's what they want to know about. How can you inspire me, educate me, entertain me, and help me? Can you touch their hearts? And this is in the most boring topics on the planet. I don't care what your topic is, you can actually touch people's hearts and minds and entertain. They do epic events, huge, huge events. They license it. And we've seen this event with Felix leaping from the edge of space. What's that got to do with a drink? Okay, so it sits though within their, their actual brand essence. It doesn't mean you create content about anything, it means you actually create content that actually creates conversations around your brand. The other thing that's starting to happen too is brands are bypassing media. Beyonce, back at the end of 2013, announced her new album. She didn't use one piece of traditional marketing and she broke iTunes records. She didn't use any traditional media, she just put it up on iTunes. And what I've discovered is that I haven't had to pay for traditional media because that's what social media allows you to do, bypass the gatekeepers. You want to publish a book? You don't have to ask permission anymore. Just publish, put it on Amazon. We are seeing the democratisation of everything. Publishing, marketing, entertainment, the taxi industry. So we are in one of the biggest disruptions to business and humanity I think we've seen in a long time. That's happening at a pace we just, we're struggling to keep up with. But there's the biggest challenge is this. What I've been trying to do is educate and inspire people to actually accept new ideas. I discovered I was leaving one piece out. And this is a piece by John Maynard Keynes. It wasn't written last week or the month before or last year. This is written decades ago. The difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as escaping old ones. And that's the challenge you have in the boardroom and in your organisation almost every day. And I've had a chat with some you know, senior social media people in the industry 
and they said the biggest challenge they have is getting permission to lead with social. Not TV, that's easy. We've been doing this for 50 years. But to actually lead a campaign with something like social or content, that's your biggest challenge. So we touch on some 11 insights that I've observed some of the people and best brands industry. Who's heard of Upworthy here? One of the fastest growing content marketing, I call them publishers, in the world. Okay. We need to make it super social. I'm not talking just having a grayed out little share button down the bottom hidden with your brand because it looks good for designers. I'm talking about making it really easy for people to do these things. Grow your social networks. Since early on when I started the blog, I relentlessly built followers on Twitter. Twitter could have fallen over, it could have changed its algorithm, but guess what? It worked. I got given a hard time because five years ago I automated Twitter. I had the social media purists throwing stones at me from the sidelines, publicly on Twitter, on Facebook. And I ignored them because for me it worked. It was a tool. You've got to understand that social networks are a tool. The people on them are the humans that you need to connect with. So they optimise for growing their social networks. They have a slider, they have a pop-up that comes up on top of a video. What's happening is these are technology-driven optimization. You can get all the traffic in the world, but what you need to do is actually use your technology to do this for you. You really need to be optimising. And that's what I'm doing in my blog too. So I've actually just implemented a new um, automation marketing platform for me as a blogger. In fact, I think blogging's got a bad name. I shouldn't be called a digital publisher. Because blog's supposed to be for the geeks, isn't it? And I'm not a geek, okay? I can't program. But for me, um, blogging has become cool because the geeks have been told they're inheriting the earth, apparently. So, the other thing they optimise for sharing. Look at the numbers here. Just by doing that, if we go back to the other one here, 620% more likes by just implementing these technology tools. 398% increase in sharing because they actually use these particular tactics. Now, these guys do crazy content stuff, right? It's about what we call superficial Sometimes crap, we call it. But the reality is you can learn from what they do. Just get some ideas. How could I take that and implement it on my blog? How can I take this and use it to grow my social networks? How can I grow my distribution? Because there's really two things you've got to do. Create the best content you can and build the biggest distribution network you can. Because there's two pieces to content marketing. Content. Marketing. A lot of people say I'm going to create the best content and it's just going to show up. It won't. One billion websites and counting, you are in a very, very crowded space. Curate. Some say, well, how do I create all this new unique content? Don't. Find some great content, collect it, curate it, and then reframe it. Upworthy basically took this video that they knew worked, 1 million views. They just changed the headline, reframed mm. it. Guess how many views they got? You want to like hazard a guess? 5 million? More? 10 million? 17 million. Same content, reframed. Love the headline. Two lesbians <laughs> raised a baby, and this is what they got. Okay. Just a fraction. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That type of headline is what we call the curiosity gap. Yeah. Which is up worthy is famous for. We're going to touch a little bit on that. So reframe. So curate, reframe, republish, repackage, and reuse. So. The problem on social media blogs is, and I've removed the dates from my blogs. Why? 
because people saw old content as bad content. Now, it does people's heads in, but I did it for a reason, and I copied some of the best on the planet that were doing it, like Copy Blogger, because I realised that that's what people were doing. They were actually going yesterday's news, even though it was evergreen content that was actually relevant three, four years later. So what you need to do is re is actually reuse. New York Times did this and became one of their top articles. Now that's my Flipboard magazine. Basically what New York Times did was took old content and put it on Flipboard. And it became one of their top articles for the whole year. In other words, they put their content somewhere else. Resurrect old content, repackage it, and turn it into different revenue. Okay? So or basically repackage and reuse. In other words, what you can do is you get really savvy about how to use your content. We live in a time where the 24-hour news cycle is done and dusted. You speak to journalists now, it's about every hour producing something new. And that's the challenge for you as a brand because you've come from a, what it's say would be a paradigm of campaign marketing. We're never going to move and push that, I'm not saying not do it, but what I'm saying you need to move to is what we call continuous marketing. Because Google hates silence. You've got to keep putting content out there, it's going to get indexed. BuzzFeed to do this actually created templates. In other words, they use technology to quickly create quizzes. And you say, quizzes? Why would you use that? BuzzFeed, one of some of their biggest content pieces is actually quizzes. 20 million views on this particular quiz. Could you use a quiz in your organisation as part of your content marketing strategy? I bet you could. So, what you need to do is think about how can we use technology to actually create efficient, fast publishing that breaks the old cycle of 24 hours. Okay, so, okay, these big blogs like, you know, and websites like the New York Times, Upworthy, these guys, they you know, they've got lots of money. Okay, Movoto, a little real estate company in the US, decided to copy a lot of what we're talking about today. The likes of Upworthy, what the likes of BuzzFeed were doing, the likes of Red Bull. They do basically services and statistics and facts about Real estate, really boring stuff. You'd think, look at their reframing. 33 things people from Michigan have to explain out of town is. That's a reframing, it's about statistics and facts and information. So they're taking what they've got and reframing it, making a really cool headline. Guess how many readers they have to their blog every month? 18 million. So don't tell me your stuff's not sexy enough to get traction. These guys have done it with real estate stats. All right. The other thing is, I believe they're actually starting to make more money out of this than actually make out of real estate stats. But there's one thing I want to point out, and one lesson to pull out of Movoto. Movoto, hustle. It's a marketing piece at the end of content. What they do is they nurture relationships with top publishers and every content creator actually has to send 30 emails every day. Build on top of a relationship that they'll say, look, we've created this content, we think it might be relevant for you, and they handcraft those emails and send them out. That's their marketing 101 process from ideas to hustle. Also, what you need to consider is the hustle is also starting to move in what we call the influencer model. In other words, they get influencers in their niche to actually get to share the content and even hire them. And this is a real thing that's starting to happen now. I got flown to Adobe as an influencer. I'm getting flown to Las Vegas in two months as an influencer. I'm getting flown to, to France as an influencer. And you have a look at a lot of the top fashion blogs and that, they're getting moved around and asked to participate and pay to actually be an influencer. So think about how you could use influencers in your niche to actually get your content to move. Search engines. I forgot this early on when I started. But guess what? 
it can bring 300% more traffic. And on my blog, even though I've got 300,000 Twitter followers, this drives 300% more traffic than social for me. Because if you can rank number one on Google for certain keywords and phrases, you'll get a lot of traffic. So social media facts, if you Google that, I think I might be still ranked number one. That drives a thousand hits per day for me. So what you've got to understand is that we need to look at, we mentioned, we talked about the term before, integrated marketing. It's not just about social. Social sexy, it's cool, it's funky, it's new. Okay, don't forget search. Very, very important. I remember having a conversation with the biggest telco in Finland, <coughs> running a workshop with the CEO and Chief Marketing Officer, and I said, you need to be looking at search seriously. And marketing guy sort of spoke to me and I said, are we doing anything on search at the moment? He's a 4,000 person company and they're not doing any focused SEO. They're only missing out in 300% of traffic. And guess what, they actually weren't using social for marketing. These are bright people. But the problem is that the marketing manager is like my age, but he's a bit younger. It's 23. <laughs> <laughs> so the reality is that search is huge. Okay, you need to be optimizing for session day one. Email is old. You think it's on its knees. We've got WhatsApp, we've got Snapchat. Guess what? It works well. There's one way to use email, which is an interesting term, which is called content upgrade. What is a content upgrade? Okay, so someone reads, turns up your blog and they really read about, okay, um, Facebook marketing. In there, there might be an article halfway down the page saying, 10 tips, get our ebook, 10 tips on Facebook marketing, um, click here. To get it, they actually have to put their email in. This can increase email acquisition by, wait for it, 600 to 800%. And that's on top of your pop-up boxes, on top of your boxes at the bottom. So we're talking serious optimization. It takes resources. Boy, it works. It's called content relevance. Tap into the power of user-generated content. Creating all your content is a huge challenge. And if you don't have the resources, you've got to get smart about how you do it. Now, I'm on the board, disclaimer, I also have shares in Shutterrock, New Zealand startup. And what we do is we curate content from the fans, like we've just run a campaign for Lady Gaga where she gets her fans to create content for her, share it to a website, share it on social. It's tagged, it's moderated, it's curated. It's done at scale. So, tap into the power of user-generated content. And I'm going to give you a fact about how big that is. Octoly last year came out with some research that showed that 99% of the content for some brands that had, you know, advocates and fans such as Apple and Lego and all those guys, 99% of the content about the brand just on YouTube was created by fans and advocates. It's a lot of content, isn't it? And I'm sure you, some of you have got passionate people who love what you do. In other words, it's actually getting engaging them and giving them the tools to actually share your content created for you. If you're going to do content marketing at scale, you're going to need a platform. It's not going to be done with Hootsuite, TweetDeck, Tweety, Twitter feed. You're going to need a platform. There's a whole bunch of them out there. Sprinkler, Teradata, Adobe, Salesforce, the race at the top end in the enterprise space, and some of you are in it and some of you aren't, um, is actually huge to actually capture this market. Because doing social, digital, and content marketing at scale is a lot of moving parts, and you're going to need tools and technology you'll need to automate. Second last point, optimise your headlines. How important is this? Upworthy think it's so important that they get their content creators to write 25 headlines. 25. That's all. Why do they do that? Because they think it's so important they need to actually get the best headlines. And guess what? 
some headlines outperform the others by 59 times. So, 59 times. 8,000 to 474,000. I'll read the headline out for you actually because it's a bit small. One is, remember Planet of the Apes, it's closer to reality than you think, 8,000 page views. The other one, two monkeys were paid unequally to see what happens next. Okay, so you've got a test. And I use Twitter quite often to test my headlines. Why headline types work? Okay, I'll give you some tips, just top level. Large listicles, BuzzFeed are great at that. 21 unique problems. Odd numbers tend to work better, strangely enough. Curiosity Gap, Upworthy. They've, they've got really good at creating a headline that goes, I've just got to check it out. Headlines that target initial cause because you'll tap into the passionate evangelist within that core of fruition. And here's one, 21 unique problems only people who go to a Christian college understand. And then go and have a look back at my voto. What was it? 33 things Michigan out of town has only understand. Very niche. But it doesn't mean that it won't have broad appeal. Last one. Use and optimise visual content. Now, I've just ran an experiment using visual tweets over just a tweet with a hashtag and a link and a, good, and a headline. I found I've got 600% more engagement. And the other numbers on impressions are just as, not as high as that, but they're all above 100% uplift. It's staggering. So if you can do that, natively put visuals in your strength. And what I've done is tested as well, as I've tested normal, like fun images, good images, versus a mini infographic. And guess what? Double the number of retweets. Just by doing that. So it's about testing, seeing what works. The other thing that Mavoto have done in their research is they discovered that images with people work the best. Hands down. That's what the research shows. So they've got an insights. They've got nothing much to do with your industry, maybe, but there is a lot of key tactics you can take from that and weave them into what you're doing within your organisation. Now, if I hadn't started six years ago, nothing would have happened. So what I'm going to say to you is, done is better than perfect. Thank you for sharing.